briefly introduce you, you should have gotten the flyer that came along the, the original invitation. And um, Jake is with Kuskuri Electric and um, is the manager for, and help me with this, public- uh, The marketing and member services manager. There we go, yeah, keep me. And rather that you didn't come here to listen to me, you came here to listen to Jake. So I'm gonna turn you over to Jake. Well, I, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the SOCAN group and um, my, my interactions with, with Bill and Ed have been nothing but um, a joy. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I, I am fighting a bug. So if you see me grabbing a cough drop or um, uh, some water, we're gonna try to press through tonight, but please be, be tolerant if my voice comes and goes. Uh, but, but hopefully we'll be good. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight tonight about electric vehicles and uh, the the potential they have to uh, greatly reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in the Pacific Northwest and some of the exciting opportunity that comes along with electric EVs and some of the the challenges that we have to overcome if we're going to have widespread adoption of EVs because there, uh, there's a few hurdles um, that, that are in our way too. So why would anyone want to drive an EV? Um, I think they're fun. I don't know if everyone uh, here has had an opportunity to drive one. If you haven't, uh, go to a dealership that has, has one. Uh, they're, they're seeing more and more of them around and uh, asked to drive one. They are not a penalty box. They are, they're an exciting vehicle to drive. I'm a, I'm a car person and uh, I fully enjoy uh, driving electric vehicles. Uh, but a little more serious note than fun, they are a significant source of beneficial electrification. So that's a term that you hear uh, tossed around quite a bit. Um, it's a, uh, uh, there's, California has set out some pretty, uh, pretty ambitious beneficial electrification goals. And beneficial electrification is a, a term uh, that's used uh, for replacing a, a fossil fuel energy source like gasoline, uh, propane, uh, heating oil, natural gas, uh, with electricity that uh, comes from a, a cleaner source. So we reduce overall emissions. And if we're effective uh, at um, implementing beneficial electrification, it can also reduce energy costs too. Uh, EVs are in the EVs have a much lower, I was gonna say inexpensive, but unfortunately EVs are still um, a little more expensive than their gasoline counterparts. So uh, that, that's not true uh, yet, uh, but the, uh, the purchase price of EVs is dropping ra rapidly, but EVs do have a much lower operating costs, uh, lower maintenance costs and um, significantly lower uh, fuel costs. And we'll get into a little bit of that um, in a minute. If we effectively uh, integrate electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging into the grid, it has the potential to lower the energy cost for everybody, not just EV owners, but uh, everybody in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we, can, we can bring down energy costs and we'll, we'll do a little deeper dive into to how that could work also. And um, one of the, the uh, most common uh, concerns I hear, it's not really a concern, but when we talk about EVs, some of the uh, the pushback I get is there's just a lot of unknowns. People don't know what EVs are available. They, they get nervous about range, uh, about charge times, uh, about cost, about reliability, how long is the battery going to last. And we've uh, put together a, a page on Who's Curry Electric's website that we're pretty excited about. Uh, if you go to our homepage, it's under My Energy and Electric Vehicles. And uh, that's Coos Curry's uh, Chevy Bolt. 
in the banner there. But we have a, just a ton of information about electric vehicles that I, I suggest people uh, spend a little bit of time uh, looking through and you can uh, get a lot of your questions answered here. A lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is already here, uh, so you, you don't need to take notes. Um, but uh, kind of a high level overview of why EVs might be a good solution. Uh, some EV facts. There are, there are situations where with current infrastructure, an electric vehicle might not be the, the right solution for somebody, but uh, it talks about uh, where they're a good fit and where they, they might not be an ideal fit just yet. One of my favorite pages, the savings calculator. So uh, this page is preloaded with Coos Curry's residential rate. So this is actual real numbers. And um, you, can, you can play with the fuel prices because those tend to fluctuate a lot. And your gas mileage of your vehicle. And if you don't know that, the drop down menu, you can, you can pick your vehicle out of the menu and it'll pre-fill all that for you. And if you know what EV you're looking for, it'll pre-fill all that for you also. And uh, it uh, graphically shows the, uh, the price difference in uh, over time traveling on a certain number of miles. So you can put your annual mileage in there. And 15 miles is the national average. So we can see this, uh, the default car, which is a pretty reasonable car, gets 24 miles to the gallon. That's not too bad. It's still going to cost about $1,500 a year more to gas up than it's going to to charge. And that doesn't account for other savings like never needing an oil change and some of that other great stuff. A particular interest to, to this group, I think, will be the uh, CO2 emissions page. Uh, this page is also uh, pre-filled out with the carbon content of Coos Curry Electric's fuel mix, uh, but you can change the number if you want to play with it. And again, the same, uh, same default gas vehicle, getting 24 miles to the gallon, uh, driving up 15,000 miles a year, is uh, going to emit 11,839 pounds of CO2. And if you wonder how you get that many pounds of CO2 out of that, uh, that gas, there's, uh, there's a little chemistry lesson uh, at the bottom if you, if you want to dive that deep. Uh, the, the EV that we, with our default EV here, using Coos Curry Electric's actual uh, carbon, the carbon intensity of Coos Curry Electric's fuel mix is 129 pounds a year. That, that's a huge a reduction in greenhouse gases. Another challenge to EV adoption is some of these just aren't well marketed yet. A lot of dealerships aren't real familiar with them. The salespeople have a hard time selling them because they don't have the, the knowledge base yet to really uh, promote them. Uh, we are seeing that, that change, but um, uh, this page will list all of the electric vehicles that are currently available and, and the, the price range uh, that they're in, whether or not there's uh, tax credits available, uh, the range and some of the, the quick facts of, about them. And you can filter by bank brand or price range, uh, but it's uh, it's a comprehensive list of all the electric vehicles that, that are available. Uh, Bill and I were talking about the, um, and here somewhere, uh, the Mustang Mach-E uh, earlier uh, before uh, the meeting today. And it, it looks like a, a really neat car. My wife and I had a chance to, to go sit in one. We didn't get to drive it. Uh, that didn't fit into our schedule. Uh, but there's some very exciting cars coming out. Uh, and then this, this page, uh, 
When you're talking about EVs, you're going to see the term EV or BEV as a battery electric vehicle. So that's something that does not have a gasoline engine in it at all. It operates just on batteries. A PHEV is a um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So that has a, a battery pack, a, typically a smaller one than an EV, and a gasoline motor. Uh, and this is a list of all the, the plug-in hybrids. I think plug-in hybrids are kind of a shoulder technology until we, uh, until EV technology really matures. But for people with range anxiety, uh, these cars, you can fill them up with gas and you can go as, as far as you need to, like any traditional vehicle. Uh, but they have a, an EV only range. Uh, so this Hyundai would easily allow me to drive to work three or four days for needing to charge on the electric motor only and never having to uh, start up the gas motor for short trips. And then uh, the, the tax rebates that are available, EVs are still a little bit more expensive than uh, traditional internal combustion vehicles, uh, but there are uh, federal tax credits and state tax credits that are available that can help bring that cost down to uh, real close to, to price parity between the two vehicles before you even consider the savings and operating costs. And then uh, a, a charger finder map. It, um, uh, it's helpful because range anxiety is still a, a real thing. That a lot. I, I'm nervous about getting an EV because I, I don't know if I can get where I'm going. And this is helpful because we can in real time see the, the charging infrastructure be uh, built out. There's, there's a significant investment uh, taking place. So the Pacific Northwest, uh, Oregon and Washington, have committed to uh, achieving significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And they've set a goal out there, and this, this is not a mandate at this point, it's, it's just a goal of reducing economy-wide greenhouse gases by 80% by the year 2050. So that's the state of Oregon and the state of, of Washington. And they, hired a company called E3, uh, which is Energy Environmental Economics. They're a consulting firm who uh, helps uh, policymakers develop energy policies and helps utilities uh, strategically implement those policies. They're a think tank out of San Francisco. And they wrote a incredibly text dense, incredibly thick uh, assessment of what it was gonna take to uh, reach the 80% by 2050 goal. And there is not a single pathway to get there that does not uh, require the electrification of the passenger vehicle sector. Uh, passenger vehicles are the largest source of greenhouse uh, gases in the Pacific Northwest. And we just can't, it, there's no road to meet that goal that doesn't include electrification of passenger vehicles. So if we're going to, to meet this goal, and again, it's just a goal at this point, it's not a mandate, uh, but sales are gonna have to ramp up quickly. 70% uh, of all passenger vehicles would have to be uh, battery electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids by 2030. And 100% of all passenger vehicles, new passenger vehicle sales would have to be uh, EVs or hybrids by uh, 2035. So this is a, a chart that I, I stole straight out, their, out of their study. And we are, and we're, we're right in here. And you can see we're right at the point where the, uh, the gasoline vehicle cells and the battery electric vehicle cells need to 
to diverge if we're going to, to be successful in meeting a goal like that. And by uh, 2025, 2030, that curve gets, gets really steep. And uh, by, by 2035, half the vehicles on the road, uh, this is vehicles on the road, not vehicle sales, uh, vehicles on the road would be plug-in hybrids or battery electric vehicles. Uh, these, these small the slivers down the bottom are diesel and, and propane. They don't account for uh, a large percentage of the, the segment. So it's, it's mainly, mainly gasoline that would be displaced. So we've got some goals that require uh, transportation electrification. Uh, so we're going to get into now how, how we might go about doing that. And most of what I'm going to talk about is from an electric utility perspective. Um, uh, so everything's going to uh, have that, that industry slant. Uh, and we're going to spend most of our, our time talking about the, the, the challenges that an electric utility is going to face uh, from widespread electrification and uh, some of the, the exciting opportunities there are with widespread electrification. So just so we're talking the same language, uh, traditional, or when we talk about EV charging, there's three types of charging. Uh, level one doesn't, does not require any additional infrastructure. You just plug the, the cord into a regular 110 volt household outlet. Uh, it's sort of slow. That would normally charge at about one to 1.8 kilowatts. A level two charger is what people think of when they think of EV charging at home. It's the box that sits on the wall and has a dedicated 220 volt circuit and it's going to charge much, much faster. Uh, those range from just over three to just under 20 kW for a charge rate. And then DC fast charging we sometimes hear that inadvertently described as level three charging. There's technically not a level three charging. Uh, DC fast charging is uh, very specialized infrastructure that bypasses the internal charger in the car and puts DC voltage directly into the battery. Uh, so it can charge extraordinarily fast. Um, so level one, if you needed to travel 100 miles in our kind of typical uh, EV, that's going to take about 28 kilowatt hours. So using a level one charger, that's going to take about 16 hours to get you the energy you need. A level two charger, uh, that's going to take about uh, three and a half hours using a 7.7 kW charger, which is the most common size today. <clears throat> and a, a DC fast charger, uh, those, uh, the slower ones would get you the energy you need in um, uh, eight minutes. Um, the extraordinarily fast ones um, in uh, just a, a minute or two. Uh, So when we talk about the charging, I think it's helpful if we take a step back and we look at the, the power grid as a whole. Uh, this is a little infographic of a, of a power grid. Uh, we have some, some power plants over here. We have transmission lines. Uh, we have a substation. And we have distribution lines that go to our, our homes and businesses. Uh, this, this grid needs to uh, operate like a highway that can never have a traffic jam. Uh, so we can never have any congestion. Uh, we, we can't have too little generation. We can't have not enough room on the transmission lines. Uh, we can't have not enough room or capacity in the, the substations or in the lines serving your, your home. Uh, if those lines run out of room, then we have uh, some 
pretty bad things happen. That's how you, you end up with some of the, the cascading outages that, that we've seen on the East Coast in the past. Um, and if you run out of generation, you uh, have some frequency issues that require you to turn people's power off like we saw in Texas during that deep freeze uh, not too long ago. Uh, so if everything has to, uh, has to flow smoothly. So if we think of our highway analogy and the grid is a highway that can never have a traffic jam. Uh, I don't know if any of you have tried to get through Wilsonville heading to Portland at eight o'clock in the morning or 5.30 in the evening. Um, it, it's not pleasant. So what kind of highway do we need to have to never have a traffic jam on I-5 heading through Wilsonville and in Portland? It would, it would have to be 30, 40 lanes wide going each direction, right? Uh, and then most of those lanes would sit empty all night long and during the day. Um, well, unfortunately, that, that's how the, uh, the power grid is, is built. Uh, we, we have to build it 30, 40 lanes wide so we can handle the, uh, the busiest day of the year. And that's important because EVs are, can be a pretty significant new load uh, that the has been unaccounted for is when we, when we plan and build the grid up to this point. So hopefully I don't put anyone to sleep here, but I, I want to spend just a second talking about power versus energy. Um, it, it, it gets a, get a little technical, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep it simple. Uh, but the, the, the two terms and um, are, are really important when we talk about EV infrastructure. So power is how much electricity you want to use at any given time. So if we, if we go back to our, our highway analogy, uh, power would could be the speed that you're traveling. Um, energy is how much electricity you use over time. So back going back to our highway analogy, energy would be the, the distance you travel. And while there's a, a direct relationship between power and energy, just like there's a direct relationship between uh, speed and distance, they're, they're not the same thing. Uh, if you need to take a, a 50 mile trip and you drive one mile an hour, it's gonna take you a lot longer to make that trip than if you drive 100 miles an hour. Uh, so your power, your speed, change radically, uh, but the distance could be the same. So when you get your home energy bill, uh, you're, you're billed in kilowatt hours. And so that's, that's the distance you travel. That's how much energy you've consumed all at once. Uh, for residential uh, households, uh, they don't uh, pay for the, the power, how much they need at one time. It's, it's kind of all bundled into the rate. Uh, but a typical home in Coos Curry would use 10 to 20 kilowatts. Uh, so uh, if you use 10 kilowatts for an hour, you would use 10 kilowatt hours, and that's what you'd get, get billed for. Uh, and that is important when we start trying to visualize what it looks like when we add EV infrastructure and we, we start building out, especially DC fast charging. So the kind of leading edge fast charging technology right now is the, the Tesla version three superchargers. And those are capable of delivering energy at a rate of 250 kilowatts. Uh, so that, that's a, a lot of energy. If we go back to our typical home example, a, a Tesla V3 supercharging station with four chargers in it, each charger are those kind of white uh, monolith looking things you see in parking lots where they have Tesla charging stations. So there's usually between four and, and eight, depending on the, the charging station. Uh, so if there were four of them and there were vehicles there, uh, that newer Teslas that can accept energy at this rate, uh, charging at one time, that would be the equivalent of adding 64 homes uh, to the power grid. That's the equivalent load of uh, 64 new houses in Brookings. Uh, 
um, Electrify America has uh, tried to one up Tesla and uh, some of the, the new European cars. They're, they're extraordinarily expensive now, but um, this is kind of the leading technology are able to deliver energy at up to 350 kilowatts. So an Electrify America station with uh, four chargers in it, those were all four were being used at one time and the people were charging at a rate of 350 kilowatts. That's the equivalent of 92 homes. Um, that's a pretty good sized subdivision uh, that, that those four little chargers in the corner of a parking lot are the equivalent to. Uh, when, we, when we have to build out the grid. So this is a artist's rendering of a proposed Tesla supercharger station uh, in Southern California. Uh, it looks like a, a beautiful facility. They have solar panels on the, the covers. Um, uh, it kind of looks like the future to me, right? Um, if those are Tesla uh, version three superchargers, and I counted about 30 chargers in this picture, there might be some more around the corner that we can't see, but I'm just gonna assume it's 30. And everybody was charging at one time. Uh, this place was, was full. That would be a, about a 10,500 kilowatt load or a 10 and a half megawatt load. Uh, so to supply energy to this facility, we would need a substation about the size of the one that uh, supplies energy to Brookings, uh, or we'd have to double the size, the capacity of that substation in order to, to manage this, this one uh, charging facility. So fast charging is exciting. Uh, we, we need to, it needs to be a reality when people drive, they, they don't want to park for two hours on the side of the road and, and charge slowly, uh, but it's something that needs to be uh, well implemented uh, because when this new load comes on and it's during a, a an event when the energy demand in the region is high, the only way that we can meet this, uh, this load is with natural gas peaking plants. Um, and that, that kind of defeats piece the purpose of our wonderful low carbon fuel mix here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, DC fast charging is well out of the scope of what Coos Curry Electric is going to have significant influence in. Um, but I just, I really think it's an important part of the conversation uh, when people start hearing about these cars that can charge really fast and get really excited about that. We need to, uh, to understand what what it takes to support that. So here is something that Coos uh, Curry can have, a, and our Coos Curry members can have a, a lot of influence over, and it is uh, residential home charging. And this is where I get really excited. I mean, DC fast charging is a great technology, and it's necessary if I'm going to take a long road trip, but. Uh, people charging at home uh, on Goose Curry lines is uh, something that I look forward to, and I think we have just a lot of opportunity with. So this graph here is a, a load curve Goose Curry electric. This is what it uh, typically looks like on a winter day. So at, at midnight, uh, these are megawatts on this on the uh, y-axis. Uh, so early in the morning, I uh, hope most people are still in bed and we don't, don't have a, a lot of load. And then starting around six, uh, people uh, get up and home activity picks up. Uh, hot water heaters are running, uh, home heaters are running. And sometime around nine o'clock, we will uh, we'll peak. And then as the sun comes up and the The day warms up, heaters uh, are less stressed, people uh, go to work, um, the nighttime chills taken off of houses, uh, people aren't using hot water as much, so we have a trough during the day. And then uh, starting around five o'clock, we have an 
evening peak when people come home and go about their evening activities. And the evening peak is always considerably less than the morning peak. Uh, and, and then it, it trails off uh, rapidly after 9 p.m. And because of the way our, our climate is here and the, we are a largely residential load, this, I see this curve day after day after day. It's, it's actually kind of boring because it, it never, it doesn't change much, uh, but that helps with planning. Um, when we go back to our analogy of the grid being a highway that can never have a traffic jam, we can see it at night and during the day, uh, there's, there's not a lot of traffic on the road, but we have a couple hours here when it's commuter time and we have a bunch of traffic on the road. And if we keep adding more and more cars to uh, this, this really busy time on the grid, we run out of uh, generation. So we, we need to back up the carbon free hydro generation that we enjoy in the Pacific Northwest with generally natural gas peaking plants, which do, do emit um, carbon. And people often ask, well, what about wind and solar? Uh, and we use wind and solar. Well, in the winter, there's not too much uh, solar being generated at uh, seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning. And generally that's a calm time of the day too. So wind and solar production uh, start picking up over here, um, especially here where we don't need it quite as bad. Uh, so. So we, if we add load here, uh, we, we usually have to use a fossil fuel resource, unfortunately. So can we avoid that? I think we can. Uh, I have two, two goals uh, that I have been set out in front of me to um, avoid adding to the peak and uh, helping transition to uh, transportation electrification. Uh, goal one is pretty simple. Uh, let's reduce EV charging during peak hours and let's make sure that everybody can still charge enough so that their vehicle state of battery is sufficient to complete whatever trips they need. So we, we avoid adding to that peak but people uh, can still go about their business. Uh, goal two is a little more aspirational, but we wanna prepare for a future when EV charging can provide um, uh, in a way that meets the driver's needs and can provide grid service and, and uh, benefit uh, Coos Curry and the, the Pacific Northwest as a region as a whole. As a whole. So, so to do this, uh, this is the exact same load curve that we looked at earlier. And again, we have our, our peak in the morning. We have some unused capacity at night. So what if I can, we can get uh, EV owners to, to charge at night? What would that look like? Well, it could look something like that. We, we, we add load at night when there's no impact. We have plenty of generation. And during the day, uh, when the generation is a little tighter, uh, we haven't added to the load one bit. So that, if we can do this, then I would meet goal one. Uh, we're better utilizing the carbon-free generation and uh, the, the money that's been spent on the existing electric grid uh, to, to meet our EV charging needs. So goal two, the one that's a little more aspirational would look like this. So now we have more vehicles that are electrified. So we've, we've added uh, significantly to the load at night, but uh, what if we could implement a program that's called uh, peak shaving and during the the, the days of the year when the grid is most stressed and power is the most scarce, 
uh, what if in the morning we could ask people to have their EVs plugged in and that they charge at night to dispatch, let's say, 5% of their battery uh, back onto the grid um, to uh, support the grid uh, during these, these uh, times of uh, high demand and um, uh, high stress on the grid. We, we've lowered our peak. We've, um, uh, we've not had to fire up natural gas peaking plants. And this power delta here, this um, the cost of this energy is extraordinarily expensive. So uh, if a program like this is well implemented, people could charge for nine and a half cents a kilowatt hour at night, and then could uh, dispatch uh, five kilowatt hours uh, during this time back to the grid. And those five kilowatt hours might be worth $5 a kilowatt hour instead of nine and a half cents. Uh, the, the, um, the, the power cost um, right here during peak days just gets extraordinary. Uh, so I think that, that becomes a win-win. Um, this technology is in current development. It's not widely deployed anywhere. It requires some specialized infrastructure. We need to have chargers that have revenue grade metering in it. So when people are, are dispatching power out onto the grid, they are, you know how much it is and they can be adequately compensated for that. Um, but uh, this is this is on the, the radar and this is where the, the huge opportunity to greatly extend uh, the, the life of the, the hydro system in the Pacific Northwest lies and to keep everyone's uh, power bills down. There's, there's a, a huge cost savings opportunity here also. And just one more illustration. Uh, this is a, a graph of a Coos Curry member's usage. Uh, we have half hour intervals here. And he is working with me on a, a charging program to see what charging looks like after hours. Uh, so his house, similar to uh, the Coos Curry load curve in the morning, uh, not a, doesn't use a lot of power. And then about six o'clock in the morning, he says heater comes on and they, they get up and uh, start um, getting ready for the day. And uh, so we can see that their, their household energy usage spikes. And then it drops off during the day. Um, it looks like he does something around lunch each day. Um, uh, but in the evening, uh, he has a, a smaller peak, and his evening peak is, is considerably smaller. Uh, so this gentleman has been uh, charging his Tesla Model 3 using a 7.7 .7 kW level 2 charger, and he charges starting at 11 p.m. Uh, it's no effort on his part. He just tells the car when to charge, and he plugs it in when he gets home. At five o'clock and the car uh, just sits quietly in his garage and then at 11 o'clock uh, when he's in bed it's, it starts charging so he doesn't have to run out to the garage at 11 p.m and plug it in um, but we, we see a really flat um, uh, load curve when we see EV charging because they're they, they're using the 7.7 .7 kW uh, the full time so Instead of it looking like this at night, it looks like this. Um, and this is well within the capacity of the, the service that serves this home. Uh, if we took this charging load here and we stacked it on top, if he got up in the morning and started charging his car before he went to work, uh, we would be off the graph here. Um, and that might require a larger service for his house. If, uh, where three people off a transformer do that, we have to upgrade the transformer and if the neighborhood does that, we have to build a new line to the neighborhood. Um, and, uh, the more people do it, it just it keeps backing up. You need bigger substations, maybe more transmission and more generation. Um, where if we can charge off peak like this, 
he gets to charge his car and um, we are better utilizing the, the, the carbon free resources that we have. Uh, so to, to meet those two goals uh, that I have set out for me, uh, we've been doing some education and outreach. Uh, that's how we have like the graph of the person charging that I just showed you. I've been working with some Coos Curry members. Um, Bill and Ed helped uh, helped me a lot uh, getting in touch with some people in the community that drove EVs, so I appreciate their help there. Uh, we've been conducting the home charging study. I am currently working with our board of directors to create an off-peak home charging incentive. So we've seen the benefit when people can charge at night. Uh, that has very real uh, economic value. And so I want to put together a, an incentive uh, to have people charge at night. Uh, basically, if you have an EV and you're willing to charge within a, a, a certain window, it should give you enough time to uh, have your uh, daily EV energy needs met, uh, then I, I want to give you a credit on your bill for that. Uh, the, the utilities have taken a a carrot or a stick approach. Uh, some have tried to incentivize uh, off-peak charging and some have tried to penalize you if you don't. And I, I, I think we, the carrot approach would work much better with our members. Uh, the uh, next step, uh, we have this kind of uh, uh, very preliminary form, but a home charger rebate. So if someone buys an EV, uh, we can provide a rebate uh, for home charging, or if um, the other option, as I look forward to goal two, uh, to be able to dispatch this energy, is have the utility buy, provide chargers. That way we know they have the appropriate uh, metering uh, technology in them so we could manage a, a program like that. So that's trying to be forward thinking. And uh, public fast chargers. If you go on that, on our website and look at that a charging uh, charger map, you're going to notice that between Crescent City and Breezeport, there's very little charging infrastructure. Uh, I want to do something about that. So uh, we have plans to install uh, some either CC owned DC fast chargers uh, that would be located in public uh, places, or um, we're looking at opportunities to collaborate with uh, some third party uh, partners that that's what they do is provide DC fast charging so they're the experts at it um, but when we see people traveling with EVs and they're coming through the Coos Curry service territory uh, we want them to be able to charge up and we want them to, to stop and uh, spend some time and hopefully some money in our community at the same time so that Brings me to the end of uh, my presentation, Bill. Do we, do we have any questions or comments? Um, first off, I'd like to say that this has been very informative. I really have enjoyed the talk so far. And um, there have been a number of people that have, have provided some questions. Um, and actually, Jackie's been real helpful at kind of watching them too. So maybe with some help, we'll get to a number of them. One thing you were just talking about has to do with, um, you know, the home charging and things. Um, one of the questions was about, does that require a new, um, new wiring to the house and such? So generally, no. Um, most uh, homes have a 200 amp electrical service, um, specifically what we see. And uh, most of them have uh, plenty of capacity uh, for, uh, for a 7.7 kW home charger. Um, some of the more exotic cars can accept charging at a much higher rate, uh, close to 20 kW, and uh, you start adding load like that, and you could potentially run into issues, but with the, the kind of uh, what today is a, a normal level two charging rate uh, does not require new wires to the house. Um, 
it does require a new circuit to be installed. Um, so if people try to put the chargers close to their uh, their breaker box, uh, but it will take a generally a 40 amp uh, 240 volt electrical circuit. So very similar to what an electric dryer requires. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, the home home chargers as well as the um, say Tesla or the the, the commercial ones. I say a um, couple of questions on that. As somebody had pointed out, those are for travelers, right? It's not the sort of thing that if you buy an EV, you should plan on going to one of the charging stations to do it. Correct. Um, so ideally. Uh, you would, those would be used for people that are uh, traveling, like you said. Um, so EVs are you know, getting up into the 300 mile range. I mean, some of them are 400 mile range. Uh, some of them are 200 miles. So if, if I had an EV that uh, had a 200 mile range and I needed to uh, make a trip to Costco in Med over in Medford and come back again, I would, I would need to charge somewhere. Yeah. And so I would, if I had a Tesla, I would use a Tesla charger. If I had a, a Volkswagen or Audi or uh, Mustang Mach-E, I would probably use the Electrify America charger in Grants Pass. Okay. Now this is probably a stupid question. Uh, this is just mine, hence the stupid question. How do you pay for it? Uh, is it is free? Doesn't seem like it. That's feasible. No, nope. um, it's so DC fast charging um, isn't free, and the the faster you go, generally the more expensive it is uh, because the, the the higher cost to to support it. Um, so unfortunately, today there is it's kind of a fractured environment. Um, there's charge point and electrify America uh, all have their their networks and kind of need to subscribe to their network um, oh. hopefully that that changes uh, Ford has I haven't seen it in practice yet but they have contracted with uh, charge point and electrify America and I believe uh, Abesto um, uh, and kind of all the, the, the big uh, charging companies and have aggregated that under a, a Ford charging pass that you would use. Um, yeah. uh, but generally it, it takes an account um, and you set it up with a credit or debit card and uh, you just um, uh, use the touch thing on your phone or a code when you get there. Uh, and some of them have a, a swipe um, mechanism on a, just like a, a gas pump would. Is it, 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 again, it's probably a silly question, but can you kind of equate how much for a gallon of gas versus a, however much of a unit of, of energy that you want? So, um, uh, yeah, so a, I wanna get my numbers correct here. Uh, and you'll have to forgive me if, if my units are a, a little off, but, um, I think it was a 78 kilowatt hour battery that was in the com comparison. Um, uh, but a seven, so I, I believe that's correct, but a 78 kilowatt hour battery is the, has the energy density of about two and a half gallons of gas. Um, so these, these cars are very efficient. They, if you look on the window sticker, there's an MPGE rating. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of using that energy density equivalency. Uh, and it's usually over 100 miles to the gallon um, e equivalency. So the, the issue with range is um, cars are extraordinarily efficient. Their, their fuel tank's just kind of small still. Um, and that's improving as the energy density of batteries improves. All right. Um, let's see. Um, Ed. I think, or Ed and Deb had noted Oregon HR 2021 requires all renewable power by 2040. Um, how will 
Coos Curry meet this requirement? That's sort of off the topic that we were having. Um, let me see if there were any others that, um, and I'll put Jackie on the spot a little bit. If there were others specifically that related to what you were talking about. Um, uh, let's see. Um, there was one question about, uh, is there any idea about amperage required for a level two charger versus just a typical 200 amp panel at home? So at uh, level two, that's 7.7 .7 kW, which is the most common size now. Um, that delivers energy at a rate that's sufficient to, to, to charge up a, a battery overnight uh, during off-peak hours would require a 40 amp circuit. Good. Um, let's see. Question about do EVs still make sense from a greenhouse gas reduction standpoint if the new generation required comes from natural gas power plants? Sort of yes. The um, so uh, even uh, with modern coal power plants, uh, the uh, the greenhouse gas is that a, a fully modern coal plant uh, produces is less than an internal combustion vehicle. Um, and, it's, and I think a big part of that is the the efficiency. I mean, we're I, you could probably argue that's not the case if you had a gas vehicle that got 130 miles to the gallon, um, but, but they don't. Yeah, decidedly so. Now, somebody asked for a clarification defining slow versus fast charge. Um, and I think you had mentioned kind of like 16 hours if it was a slow charge just on the, the lowest wattage of the charger. Is that right? Or? So that would be, so I was talking about um, needing to charge uh, 28 uh, kilowatt hours. So that's not a full charge on um, a modern EV. Uh, a Chevy uh, Bolt is a 60 something kilowatt hour battery. Uh -huh. um, the long range Mach-E is a 98, I think, kilowatt hour battery. I, I may not have these numbers exactly right, but I'm close. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, to, to charge the, the 28 um, kilowatt hours would take about 16 hours with a level one charger. Um, that's just the, looks like an extension cord, uh, the, a brick on it, kind of like the charger for your laptop yeah. that, that plugs into the wall. Um, uh, that, uh, that same charge would take with a 7.7 .7 kW level two charger, um, uh, about three and a half hours. Um, okay. And uh, so, Again, those are not great solutions if you're traveling. Um, uh, so we, that's where we see the, the DC fast charging and um, uh, those you know, current DC fast chargers deliver energy anywhere from uh, 50 uh, kilowatts is a slow one up to 350 for these um, lightning fast new Electrify America chargers. Um, yeah. Uh, but that that can get you the 28 kilowatt hours in minutes. Wow. Yeah, that's that makes sense then. If you're in a hurry, you pay for as a premium. And if you can afford to take a break from the drive, you can save money on that. And there's um, in Oregon, most of the chargers, uh, you are. Um, uh, that you pay for. Some of them are just a flat rate subscription like the uh, Webestos, uh, but most of those you you pay per uh, kilowatt hour that you charge. Um, and then the, the faster you're charging, the, the more that kilowatt hour costs. Oh. Um, and other states, uh, they don't allow companies like Tesla or Electrify America to resell electricity. Uh, it's just the way that the the state rules are written. 
And so there they you you pay per minute that you're plugged in. Huh. Oh, interesting. And, and sometimes it's a, a little bit of a little bit of both. Uh, you you see a per minute fee and an, an energy fee uh, because they want to incentivize people to to charge as much as they need to and then move the car and not not take up the, <laughs> the charging spots are still kind of limited. Yeah. But brings another question up to an extent. Um, one of the, the questions from Tom Bozak was asking if, if you can do anything to encourage the local dealers to support EV. I guess Tom's got a 2017 Chevy Volt, but they don't seem to be supporting that. Yep. Um, so we, the, uh, uh, Mazda doesn't have a, an EV yet. Um, uh, Chevy has the Bolt, um, uh, but Coast, I don't think it's certified to sell them yet. Uh, part of my education and outreach plan is to uh, pull together some, some information and get it to regional dealers. Uh, that could be uh, from Ashland up to Roseburg and over Goose Bay uh, with information about our program and um, it's especially once I uh, find the right solution for an EV charging uh, rebate or a utility provided charger um, uh, to en encourage people to, to engage with us. Yeah. Um, from my understanding, uh, the, the dealers, especially smaller ones, make a fair amount of their profit from the um, service work. But it's also my understanding the EVs, and I think you'd mentioned, they have a much lower service requirement. Do you getting any sort of pushback or you hear of any pushback or hanging, why the, the local or the smaller uh, dealers aren't happy with that or? Um, I haven't personally received any pushback. Uh, I just uh, going to conferences and um, uh, talking with uh, groups that are encouraging electric vehicle adoption. Uh, there, there is a concern, um, and this this change is going has the potential to be very disruptive to the traditional dealership model. Yeah. Um, you know, that's kind of outside of my area of expertise, uh, but the, um, that's, that's the, kind of the, the general consensus now is um, you, you see uh, companies like Tesla that are uh, bucking the, the franchise dealership model yeah. and um, you know, the, the vehicles don't need oil changes. Um, you know, they, with the regeneration, they hardly use their brakes. Uh, the, um, the Tesla Model 3 owner, uh, whose energy usage I shared, he's had his car for, I think, three years now, and he's filled up the um, windshield wiper reservoir twice um, and changed the windshield wiper blades. Ah. Um, and that's the extent of the maintenance that he's done to it. Hmm. What about, uh, people were asking about um, EV buses and whether it would be um, if do you know of any plans or is there any way that say our group could help um, the city of Brookings or the county you know Curry County um, to to have um, electric buses uh, so EV buses are going to be a thing um, absolutely uh, yeah. they, they exist today uh, oh, about three Four years ago, we looked at a, um, a, a grant to, to try to get one, but they were, they're just, ex the, the price premium on them is still pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Um, but a, especially a school bus is, I think, a excellent opportunity for electrification. Um, you, you think about it, they, they, they're plugged, they're, they can charge all night, um, and an hour before the driver gets there, uh, the heaters can come on and they can heat while they're plugged into the grid. Uh, so everyone shows up to a warm bus and you don't have to wait for the, the diesel to warm up. Yeah. Um, and then they, uh, 
you know, what's, what's the bus route? Uh, 20 miles? I mean, they're, they're, they don't need, an, uh, for local busing, they don't need an extraordinary range. And then they could be plugged in all day. Um, and so. I'd mentioned having listened to the uh, Environmental Defense Fund um, seminar, and they made a specific point, and I'm glad you brought up school buses because that ties in with what you're saying is that then you have the batteries of the school buses that could be helping with the load. And so the school could actually cut down on their costs. It would save Kuskuri. So it sounds like there are a whole bunch of win-win situations with this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, they're, they're still, uh, they're kind of pre-production experimental vehicles, but uh, one of the big utilities in the southeast, I don't remember if it was Duke Energy or Southern Company, uh, just partnered with a, a company that makes line trucks for, uh, I think, 10 uh, electric line vehicles. Because if you think about a, a line truck, they don't drive very far either. I mean, we, we might drive down to, to Harbor uh, from, from Brookings and you know, drive 10 miles maybe. But then uh, while they're, they're working, those trucks sit in idle all day long to run the hydraulic pumps. Yeah. Uh, so you have these idling diesels that will idle for 10 hours a day. Yeah, that sounds like, and I think we had talked about it. Um, if you're having, say, an, an RV that you're driving a little ways, but then you don't have to run a generator and you have that power when you need it. Yeah, I was, um, I'm just excited if I, the, uh, like the, the new Ford F-150 that's, uh, I, I get to watch the presentation later on this evening. Um, you, know, you have a, a vehicle with a 100 kilowatt hour battery in it. Uh, you can go out to the, the beach or uh, wherever you like, and uh, you can run um, uh, a, Traeger all day and you can run um, a radio and uh, you can pump up your uh, your kayaks and your raft. I mean, you have a huge amount of electricity uh, available uh, for your use. I mean, if you had a trailer, you could run the trailer in the evening off the, the truck. And I, I think that as you'd mentioned when we talked before, uh, for job sites, if you're a contractor and you don't have to have a generator. You don't have to. You can rely on your own truck or your your vehicles. Yep. So I would think that there are a whole lot of things that it almost be as attractive or more attractive to have an electric truck than a diesel truck or an electric car, which is interesting. Um, oh, somebody had asked uh, about um, hydrogen as a hydrogen in in lieu of, of batteries. And what I had heard that for, uh, for say city buses, because they have to be recharged on a, um, they have, it takes a while, at least the, the argument I had heard, it takes a while. And so you have to have twice as many city buses as you would of a gasoline, diesel, or a hydrogen bus. It, is that realistic or is that not, quite so true. So uh, hard, hydrogen is extraordinarily energy intensive to, to produce right now. Yeah. Um, and I, I know uh, Oregon um, I just passed a, a, a bill in the House, I believe. I don't think it's gone to the Senate yet, but maybe it has. Uh, it, we, um, putting in place a, a, a study on ways to try to generate hydrogen using renewable energy. Yeah. Um, if, if they're successful, I mean, hydrogen is a great way to store energy um, and you can generate it whenever. So you can do it when the sun's shining and the wind's blowing. Uh, but hydrogen's, there's some challenges with, um, with transporting it and dispensing it. I mean, it's a little more challenging than gas. So uh, there's smart people that disagree with me. Um, uh, there's automotive manufacturers that are working on uh, passenger hydrogen vehicles, uh, but I see the big opportunity for hydrogen being 
uh, buses and um, uh, uh, commercial trucks. Um, not, not delivery trucks that are running around town, but uh, the tractor trailers. Uh, because by the time you add enough batteries to a commercial truck, the batteries are just so heavy, right. uh, you've, you've really reduced what they can carry. Because they have what, an 80,000 uh, pound maximum gross uh, vehicle weight. Yeah. And if you, if you make the, the tractor uh, 20,000 pounds heavier with batteries, that's, that's 20,000 pounds less cargo that you can, you can carry. Yeah. Um, and I can, I could, if they can find a, a way to effectively uh, create the hydrogen, I can, um, I can see a, a, a reasonably the people putting together a, a, a system of truck stops along major transportation routes that right. they can fill up with hydrogen. I just right. um, I have a hard time at, at this point, and I'd, I'd love to be proven wrong, but it's saying um, you know, Fred Meyer dispensing hydrogen or the corner shell station. Yeah. What's interesting, it, it sort of brings up the idea there's not one solution that fits everything and tailoring it to the specific technology, tailoring the technology to specific problems and, and such. Um, that's that's interesting. Um, one question has come up um, a couple times that I mentioned it earlier, and I'm trying to get the, the HR 2021 requiring all renewable power by 2040. Um, and I don't know enough about that. And I don't know if Ed or Deb, you'd want to come off mute and explain more or the question was, uh, how, how is Coos Curry planning for that? I'm not even sure I got it right. <laughs> Ed is always good at asking the tough ones. He is. <laughs> That's why I like him. <laughs> um, so uh, this is not something that I have a lot of information on, um, but the um, my understanding is that um, uh, consumer-owned utilities have been carved out of that bill, um, so it 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 wouldn't. It doesn't set a mandate for the Coos Curries um, or like the city of Ashlands or the city of Bandons. Um, and it, it, uh, at this point, we would be offsetting carbon free uh, hydro uh, with some other carbon free source. Um, right. So you're kind of, uh, you spend some, uh, a bunch of money and you don't, uh, you don't really get anywhere. Um, that could change. I mean, these, these rules change all the time. Um, and that's, uh, so uh, just real quick for the group, um, Coos Prairie Electric doesn't actually buy power ourselves. We don't, we don't have a power purchasing agent. It's a, it's a very specialized um, skill set, requires a lot of specialized knowledge. So uh, organizations like Coos Curry Electric uh, all across the United States join uh, together and form what's called a, a generation and transmission cooperative. Uh, we, we call it a GNT. And uh, some GNTs own power plants and transmission lines, and some just uh, handle the business of, of buying and selling power. So Coos Curry Electric belongs to um, the Northwest Generation Cooperative. They're our, our GNT. So all of our power purchases are aggregated with 18 other utilities through, through PNGC. Um, and right now, most of them are all requirement Bonneville uh, customers. Uh, that's that's the, the, the contracts that everyone's in. Those contracts are gonna be expiring uh, soon. And so PNGC is working very diligently with uh, its partner, co-ops. So our, our general managers on the PNGC board, uh, the board of directors are made up of generally the GMs of the, the member co-ops uh, on um, some uh, strategic planning uh, for future when our when our all requirements contract with Bonneville is up. Uh, do we want to re-enter an all requirements contract or do we want to uh, get a, 
a, a slice from Bonneville and uh, seek the, the power elsewhere. And um, they're they're watching uh, these, uh, these these mandates very closely um, because that uh, that obviously affects your options. Well, Jake, I, I thank you very much for that. I um, I was reading about HR twenty twenty one. It seems to have an awful lot of support. Uh, I'm not sure just where it is in the legislature right now, but um, uh, <clears throat> I was just concerned about the. Uh, additional requirements on you folks that that law, if it passes, or um, what if these what if these people who buy EVs, we all get say fifty percent of the of the uh, your service area gets EVs, but don't charge at night um, for whatever reason. Is there going to be a problem for Coos Curry if some of these people are charging as you showed at those peak power times? Will there be a, I mean, how do you do that? Do you, do you just say, hey, guys, you want to own an EV, you're just not going to charge it then? Is that? So, um, yes, it would be an incredible problem um, if we had a 50%, 50% of the house has had an electric vehicle um, and they, they charge during the peak. Um, uh, that uh, we don't have capacity to handle that in both of our substations today. Um, I, I believe the transmission lines coming to our, the area are fine, um, but that's extraordinarily expensive power. And for uh, all the Coos Curry Electric members, we, they just pay a flat rate. Um, so we, you know, some of, some of, we buy some of it at a, it's extraordinarily expensive and some of it's uh, very inexpensive and we kind of uh, lump it all together and come up with a, a flat rate for everybody. Um, so if we, if, if people charged on peak in significant numbers, uh, our costs are going to go up and if we kept that flat rate model, um, uh, it would go up. Uh, so Fortunately, I guess it's not fortunate. I kind of wish we were um, a little more uh, leading edge in this area for EV adoption, uh, but uh, we're, we're not going to be, uh, you know, there's other utilities that are seeing a lot uh, more EVs than, than we are here on the Southern Oregon coast. So we can learn from what's worked and hasn't worked for them. And uh, what utilities have had to do once they uh, they have significant um, uh, EV penetration is either have managed charging where you can charge during these times and if you want to char charge outside those times. Uh, so charging at night might cost seven cents a kilowatt hour and charging in the, the morning might cost you a buck fifty a kilowatt hour um, wow. to, to make make up that, that difference. Um, But yes, if people um, adopt EVs in significant numbers here and uh, to charge when uh, during that morning peak, and it wouldn't take long to eat up that evening peak uh, too and have it exceed the morning peak, um, then uh, we, uh, we'll, we'll have to move from the, the carrot to the stick, <laughs> unfortunately. Interesting. Thanks, Jake. <clears throat> yeah, we had a comment, check. Uh, somebody was, uh, Gina was saying, find it reassuring, would, would find it reassuring to see that Coos Curry is planning for the high demand and then with climate change, be more vulnerable with fires and such. Um, adding EVs on it, how, how do we, how do you reassure um, your members? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know that I completely understood the question. Um, actually, Gina, if you'd want to uh, take yourself off mute and better <laughs> explain it, if you'd like to do that. Okay. Uh, you're, you're talking now about unknown quantities of people um, starting to use EVs and how we may have to adjust when we're using it and selling back. And it's, you're making it sound already tight right now without very many EVs 
uh, in the mix here. So suppose half the town decides to go out and get some now, uh, how well uh, can CCEC uh, supply the electricity we need? Then the second part is um, we all know how much we enjoy uh, power outages that last hours, but with uh, climate change and uh, increased storms and fires that can interrupt the powers, um, it, it'll, it'll be even more interesting when we uh, can't go anywhere. I mean, uh, unless we're all in, we have hybrids, I guess, that have gas it, uh, to go. So we just seem more vulnerable and we, we need more reassurance that you have contingencies. Okay, great question, thank you. So um, the, I, I can't charge when there's a, a power outage. Um, it's, it's something that is on people's minds. Um, I, I've heard that before. Uh, you have to remember if, if you need gas and there's a power outage, you're not gonna pump gas either. Um, uh, but I would have gas in my t tank. Right, and generally, so if you own an EV, um, you, you come home and you plug it in and it charges overnight. So it would be like having your own gas station at your house where your tank gets topped up every single night. Um, as long as the storm is timed correctly. Right. Um, During the day. Right, so if you, um, uh, there's there could be a situation that uh, you just drove back from um, uh, Portland and uh, you get home and you're, you're kind of on, on fumes, if you will, uh, not a lot of electrons left in your EV uh, and uh, Coos Curry is in the middle of a um, extensive power outage, then um, you, you wouldn't be able to charge. I mean, that's, that's something that, that could happen. Um, I, the, the gentleman that uh, has the Model 3, whose graph I showed, he charges once a week. Um, I mean, he, he, he doesn't use his entire battery every day. Um, he, he runs it down about 50% and then, then charges. Uh, so it, it's in normal day-to-day -day driving, it, you, it's, you, you won't exhaust the, the, the range. I mean, a, a long range uh, a Ford Mach-E is 297 miles. Um, and if I was, if I was on a long trip and I was uh, coming back um, at home and I, I knew that there was a horrendous storm uh, hitting the coast, I would I'd probably charge somewhere on, at one of the fast chargers on my way, even if I didn't need to to make home, uh, just so I knew I had some, some extra juice in my battery. And I would do the same thing in my gas car too. I would, if I wasn't sure that I could get gas the next morning, uh, I'd make sure that I, I didn't roll into town with my uh, my low fuel light on. You know, what you're saying is reassuring. Um, however, you also said something else that would counteract that, and that is, uh, well, we'd be plugging our coffee pots in <laughs> to, with the juice in the cars then, you know, so we would be go going through it quicker. So there's, um, uh, there is a, uh, there was a great article um, in, one of the, the North Bay Area Peninsula newspapers when they had those horrible fires several years ago and the power was out for weeks there. And people, I mean, people weren't traveling, they weren't going to work, they, you know, you, you can't do anything. Um, but the lady uh, in the article had an electric vehicle and she ran her refrigerator and her freezer for uh, six or seven days off of wow. the um, uh, they, they hold a lot of juice. Um, I, I, I guess that's a little underappreciated. Um, my house and it, it's just, just Jackie and I living there and our, and our puppy. Uh, but you know, we got to, it's all electric, electric hot water heater, electric oven, um, uh, heat pumps. And, um, Oh, I think we used, I get a daily alert. I think we used 19 um, kilowatt hours yesterday. And that's living our, our completely normal life. It was chilly in the morning. The heaters came on for a while and just we, we did our thing. Um, uh, if our power was out and we had a 
um, at the Ford Mach-E or at a Tesla um, uh, Model 3 long range with the, the 100 kilowatt hour battery. I think that's what it is. They don't really advertise the numbers anymore. Uh, I could power my house, not conserving, doing exactly what I did today for five days. Well, that's how, that is reassuring. However, I probably can't afford those vehicles, right? Um, they're, uh, the prices are coming down. They're, 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 they're still expensive. Um, uh, and um, you're starting to see them on the, the secondary car market. Um, yeah. Uh, so they're... Uh, so I'm really ignorant. Can, around. With the EVs now, can we do a round trip to the Medford airport? Um, or just the hybrids? Yes, uh, though it depends on the EV. Um, I mean, they're, they, they come in all sorts of battery okay. sizes, which is your kind of your, your fuel tank size. Um, but yes, there, there are ones that, that can make that trip. Okay, good. All right, thank you very much for reassuring me. Um, oh, but, but the, I, go ahead. still the, the part about do you have a plan as how many households you can handle right now? And you are you going to be increasing your capacity as, as the number of households go up? Um, so are you talking about uh, EV adoption or yeah. new homes? E EV adoption. So um, let's see if I can bring this back up. Uh, so if, if we look at this uh, real world EV example, um, uh, we have to size everything, the, the substations, everything has to be sized for um, these, and not even this peak here, it has to be sized for whatever the tallest peak was over the past forever. Um, I mean, so if you think about the, the most energy intensive day that this house has ever had, um, we have to size for that. And then we have to have a little margin on, on top of that. Uh, so uh, if everybody on his street added an EV and charged here, we're, we're still, we got lots of room. Um, uh, so if it's, if it's implemented well and it's managed appropriately, uh, we can have, we can add lots and lots of EVs without having to uh, build new infrastructure. Um, well, if, if 20 percent of Brookings Harbor all got EVs, you can handle that now? Yes. Um, Thank you. If, okay. if they, if, if we had 20 percent and 10 percent of them plugged in here at Brookings, we would have some, some isolated issues uh, for sure um, huh. uh, that we're, we would have to, to make some upgrades. Uh, but I mean, and this is extraordinarily expensive um, equipment. But you want us to get to 100%, right? That's what you want. Well, if we're going to reduce our greenhouse uh, gas emissions, then uh, we have to get to 100% of all new vehicles sold uh, being plugging in. And then through attrition over time, obviously the, the gas vehicles will dwindle. Okay. So you're comfortable, you don't have, I, I just want reassurance that uh, you're gonna, be, the, the supply, supply will be there. Um, yeah, so the, yeah. The, if, if we have supply issues, it's, it's not going to be because of EVs. Um, it'll be because of other, other policy decisions. And that's, I mean, we, we've seen supply okay. issues in, that sounds in cool. California, but it, it, it's, EVs are not the culprit. I'm sorry if I'm monopolizing the time here. That's no. great questions. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. Right. Um, we are three minutes before seven, and there are a bunch of people that I know that if, if, um, we had an open forum, Jake, you'd be here until 10 <laughs> because it's asking about solar power. Um, I think a good question had to do with any incentives of Kuskuri, like buying a couple of or a few um, electric cars and renting them out to people to try them. 
So, um, uh, actually, real quick on that, uh, yes. So we have our, our Chevy Bolt now. Um, I haven't decided what the, the, the right one is, but I, I have money budgeted for a second one this year. And pre-COVID, uh, we, we did some open houses where we did ride and uh, drive events. Yeah. Uh, we had Fourth Mobility from Portland bring some cars down and we let people drive their cars and, and our car. Um, and we, we definitely want to continue that. It's just this, this last year had some obvious challenges in that area. Right. Sort of COVID threw a uh, wrench into lots of things. So yep. um, I guess at the, the risk of going too long, I, and I hate cutting off discussions like this because there's way more questions, which means I guess we'll just have to have you back for another talk <laughs> or an open discussion. But whether than doing that, um, is there any sort of closing things you want to say? This has been a fantastic presentation. At least I found it fantastic. Any closing thoughts? Um, no, I think it's an extraordinarily exciting time. I, I think we're looking at uh, technology uh, rapidly catching up with some of the ambitious goals to um, improve the way we use energy and the types of energy or sources we use. Uh, and I, I you know, no, 10 years ago, I was wondering if I was in the right industry uh, <laughs> because they were talking about deregulation and we were just gonna be a company that owns some wires and that doesn't, that's not really that interesting. Um, and load was going down. People use less and less power every year uh, because when you buy a refrigerator, it uses less power than the one you replaced. Yeah. Um, so our loads going down, you know, we, we just seem less and less relevant and that's changing. Uh, we're, I, I, we're, we get to be at the table um, to participate in some of this exciting stuff. And I, I'm just uh, glad I get to get to be here for it. I can believe that. Yeah, and then throw in, we didn't talk all about the the other legislation that's working its way through of three gigawatts of, of power by thirty by 2030, and that throws an entirely different set of considerations in on it. Um, so it's an interesting time to be involved in this. So Absolutely. And with that, I, I want to say thank you very much for, for that and for Jackie letting us have you for an hour and a half and to help out sort of managing the questions. It's been great. So um, I encourage people to get off mute and say thank you. <laughs> Just a real quick shout out. I think they're still on, but um, Sonia Billington's on here. Uh, she's instrumental in putting a lot of these programs together with me. And uh, Kelsey Bozeman's on here. Uh, she's, she built our awesome looking website that has all this helpful information on it. So oh. just appreciate all their work. Yeah, fantastic. Well, as a member of- Can you write that website on the chat? It's, it'll, I'll put it on, since I'm gonna um, have the chat, um, the file, I can share that, Marina. Okay, thanks. Yep. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I'll give you the, your, your evening back, Jackie and Jake, and we'll be talking. Thank you, Jake and helpers, and thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Well Bye. done.